If you would, please, um, before we start, bow your heads one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. You're great. You are amazing, and you are merciful and, and loving, and, and I just want to thank you so much for that. I want to thank you for the fact that we can come here today and just worship worship you and and learn about that, learn about your character and learn about you. And so, Father, I'm asking that this that every word that is spoken here today would glorify you and that you would be the one that's speaking. Lord, take over your sermon, take over your message, and just implant it into the hearts of everybody here. You know, I pray. Amen. So when I was younger, uh, I did something that I believe uh, most, most kids that were raised in the United States, uh, I think, do. Um, for some reason, I was, I was frustrated, and I, I wasn't happy. I was in my house, and for some reason, I was, I was frustrated with, with my mother, actually, who's, who's right here. Uh, this is the way that I was frustrated with, and by the way, my stepdad's right there, my stepbrother's right there. But I was, I was frustrated with, with my mother for a reason I, ha I can't remember. I really cannot. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, man, I'm, I'm so upset that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run away. You know, and so I, um, so I devised a plan, and I was I was writing a a runaway note. You know, I and and it, it I can't remember exactly what it said, but I thought about it for a while. I was like, okay, this I gotta say this. I gotta make it as dramatic as possible. I need to know that that I am upset with my mother. I need to, I need to be I need to make her regret whatever he whatever she did. You know, um, so I was writing and I was writing it and. And before, and so I had, I'd finished writing it, and then I just, I put it there on the table, and I was looking at it one more time, thinking, okay, is this good? Is this, is this note dramatic enough? Is it going to make her regret what she, the fact that she made me upset? And I can't even remember what it was. I'm sure it was something like, go do your homework, you know, like something super simple, but, you know, as a kid, it was, it was just upsetting for me. And so I wrote it, and, and... I left it on my table in my room. I left it on my desk in my room, and so I'm like, okay. So I went, I left, and I, I knew in my head, okay, I knew that I wasn't actually gonna run away. I just wanted to, to have enough time away for her to read it and think, oh no, you know? And so I leave, and I'm outside for a while. I, I remember just thinking like, okay, what am I gonna do? I go, I, I go and I hang out with some friends for a little bit, and, and it, when, when my friends can't hang out any longer, I'm just like, okay, well, just gonna sit here. I was like, uh, and so eventually I just got tired. I was like, all right, you know what? I'm done with this. So I go back to the house, and everything is perfectly fine. Nothing's nothing's changed. I'm like, uh, does nobody does nobody love me here? And so I go into my room and I check to see if the note was read, and sure enough, it wasn't. It was in the exact same spot. Nothing. And I was just like, you know, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe uh, maybe I, you know, it's the my emotions are done with. I'm finally you know not upset anymore. So maybe this is a good thing. Um, and this is something that actually, as, as I said, isn't unique to me. I mean, runaway children trying, children writing notes to run away is something that is incredibly common. And in fact, uh, it's so common that there's a lot of a lot of pictures of the notes on the internet of kids of their of their notes. And I've actually gotten a few um, so that we can uh, to see because these ones were hilarious to me. Um, so this one says. <clears throat> By the time you read this, I might be leaving. If you want to see me again, I will be at the first McDonald's that you see when you go right from our house. I love you. <laughs> so obviously, this, whatever this kid was doing, obviously wanted to be found um, and, and not actually run away. Um, this next one is, is definitely my favorite. It says, I am running away because you think I farted when I didn't. <laughs> P.S. You're mean. <laughs> If there was ever a reason, that would be it for sure. <laughs> um, and then the next one says, Dear mom, dad, family, I got mad, so I ran away. Normal, right? But then at the back it says, P.S., I might come back. <laughs> um, and then this is the last one. It says, Mom, I'm going to run away tomorrow at 9.30 when you and dad are sleeping. Be sure to say goodbye forever. <laughs> From Emily, P.S. I will be packing tonight. <laughs> so these are these are to me these are are funny, but um, not to kill the mood or anything. But 
it's not always actually a, an amusing and funny thing when kids do decide to run away and when they actually go through with it. Um, I don't have any children, so I, I don't know the, the exact feeling, but I've seen people who, have, who don't know where their children are at. You know, like they don't know what, what happened to them, and it's devastating. And I'm sure the parents are, are devastated, and it's not, it's not very fun. Um, and so there's a story in the Bible that talks about a son who's running away. Um, and so if you would, please turn with me to Luke 15. Uh, starting with verse 11. And when you're there, say hallelujah. hallelujah. So, I just, just, uh, just a, a little a preface for this. Um, this is, I don't know if you guys remember the, the last sermon that I talked about, which was, the, the last sermon was the lost sheep, right? And so this is very heavily... Uh, correlated with that parable that Jesus gave because these, this is a parable that Jesus gave at the same time. He was trying to prove the same point with three different stories, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Okay, so there's, it's very heavily tied together. Um, and so you might hear some things that are, that are very similar, but this is a point that I, I believe needs driven and that needs to be heard and that needs to be really drilled into the mind, okay? Um, and also I want to say this, that I will not be able to focus on every point. This story is... An incredible story. This 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 parable that Jesus told is one that is mind blowing, and it, it it really it reshapes the way that you think of God. And so I, I won't be able to get to every point, but I do want to encourage you that when you go home, whenever from now and as as soon as possible, but whenever you can, look at this story, read this story, and study up on this story. I don't don't just read it, but also. Look at some commentaries, or maybe look online. Look at look at what some people have said. Read some articles on it, because there's so many things in this in this parable that are incredible. Um, in fact, I would actually suggest if you were wanting to look into it, I would suggest uh, there's there's two videos on YouTube. Um, that's it's actually one video, but it's split up. They split it up into two videos, and it's called it's called The Prodigal God by Timothy Keller. Uh, he's a modern day theologian. And it's, it's, he has a book called The Prodigal God, and it's pretty much, from what I've heard, this is like a, a video rendering of the book, pretty much, you know. So I would highly, highly suggest watching that. I would highly suggest even getting the book and reading it. Um, but I really do believe that this story is amazing. But just for the sake of time and for the sake of, of focusing on one thing, I cannot get into the whole thing. So please forgive me, and maybe I will touch on a little things because I just can't help it. So... Um, but if we look at, at verse, verses 11 and 12, it says this. Uh, then he said, Jesus, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So what's happening here is that there, there's a man who has uh, a good amount of estate, a good amount of, of land. He's, he has uh, enough goods okay, to, where he, to where he is able to, to give his sons... He has two sons, okay? And he's able to give his sons inheritance, right? But inheritance is something that you only get after your father has passed away. These two sons could, only should be getting the, their, their part of the inheritance when, they, when, when their father passes away, okay? And, and what's happening here is that these kids have stayed um, with their father because back then this was a common thing. I mean, you, you, you left um, the house only when, only when you were married and, if, and whatever your father did, you trained up in that as well. Like you, you became what your father has been. So an example of that would be uh, Joseph and Jesus, right? Joseph was a carpenter, so Jesus was a carpenter, okay? And this, is, this was a very common thing. And so what's happening here is that the father has land and the father has uh, money and, the, and this younger son is, is tired of the father, okay? This, this younger son is, uh, is, is, is pretty much saying to his father, father, I wish you were dead, so give me my part of the inheritance. You know, go, go and sell the land that would have belonged to me and give me that in the form of money. Give me my inheritance in the form of money. So he's pretty much spitting in his face and saying, I want what I need to get because I don't like being here anymore. Okay. Um, and verse 13, it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. 
So we see that the son, this younger son, has gotten to the point where he does not want to be in his father's household anymore. This son does not want to live because he hates his father. I mean, he's, he's not, he's not, he doesn't know his father quite well. And that's actually a, a, a point that I, would like, that I would like to make is that because the son found himself in a situation where he could, where he could no longer stand to be at home, I want to propose this idea, which was that the son, for however long he was with his father, did not actually truly know his father. The son was not aware of the character of his father. Um, and Ellen White says this. Uh, she says, oh, I'm sorry. She says, this younger son had become weary of the restraint of his father's house. He thought that his liberty was restricted. His father's love and care for him were misinterpreted. And he determined to follow the dictates of his own inclination. If the son had actually known truly the father, he would not have misinterpreted his actions. He would have trusted his actions and he would have known that even though he may feel restrained, even though he thought that he might have been restrained, he would have understood that his father loved him and his father wasn't being uh, this, this exacting, cruel, punishing father who was, who was trying to restrict him from having any fun. Okay, so there's so so he doesn't actually know his father. If you know somebody, you understand. Listen, if you know somebody, if you know your parents, even though they have your best interest in mind, and and and, and maybe at the time you don't know. Okay, like I don't know why they're telling me that I can't stay out past one in the morning. I don't know why they're telling me that I can't stay out past twelve. Um, even though you may not understand, you can you still know that okay, but they're doing it for a good reason. They love me, and so I still want to be here. But this son did not understand that because the son did not know his father. And so, in so we we so we go on. Okay, we go on and, and we we read. Actually, sorry. Um, we go on and we read. So what happens is that after verse thirteen, after he he leaves his father and wastes all his stuff, uh, he, what happens is that. The son goes to a faraway land, and he, and he wastes all his money. And while he's there, he's wasting all of his money. He just goes with prodigal living, wasteful living. Um, he actually then comes to you know, a sort of, of, of realization that he's not, in a, he's not in a good place. He's run out of money. He's sold himself to, to, a, to like a pig farmer, and he's, and he's trying to eat what the pigs are eating. That's, and that's how, that's how bad it's gotten because he's just doing anything he can to survive. Okay, and so, but, so he, comes to his, he comes to his senses, and, 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 and it says this in verse 17, um, starting verse 17, it says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Being a hired servant was different than actually being a servant. Being a hired servant meant you were hired, and that means you got paid. You got paid in order to do some of the things that, that needed to be done around the, around the estate. So, you know, you might do, you might do some of the same things as, as other servants, but, you, but it was different because you were a hired servant. Hired servants lived in town. They had their own homes. They had their families, and, and they got paid a wage, right? And just like any other job, they could work their way to becoming more and more uh, responsible for more and more things, you know, and they, they could work their way up. And so what's happening here is actually the son is starting to devise a plan to work his way back, his, to work his way back into his father's family. He's not saying, I just want to stay a, a servant forever and I'm like, I'm not going to do anything. He's saying, I want, to, I want to work my way back into your family. Okay? Um... And so he's 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 thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to uh, do as good of a job as I possibly can, so that my father will love me again. And let me just say this: in today's today's day and age, how it is for us, how this would look like in our relationship with our heavenly Father, is that we're trying is is we're, we would try to work to get back into a relationship with Him. If we've left, we think, oh. 
Father, I, I, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I messed up and I left and I left the church, but I, I need to make my way back. And so, uh, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tithe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my Bible and pray every single day. And I'm going to, I'm gonna be as nice as I, as I possibly can. And so that's what it would look like. Is that he is? That's what basically what he's trying to do. He's trying to work his way back to the family of his father, right? But the reason why he's doing this is because he didn't know his father. He didn't actually know his father. He didn't know the character of his father. So that's why he thought he had to do this. He thought that he had to do this in order to get back into the family, not knowing that his father wasn't actually looking for that. Okay? And, and to be honest, I think there's a lot of people who don't, who don't actually ever, quote unquote, come back to a relationship with God simply because they think this is what they have to do. But they don't think they're good enough. They think, I have to work my way back. And so because I have to work my way back, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I can't actually work my way back. And so they're too scared. You know, like they, they, they think that they're just not good enough. And I mean, to be honest, none of us are good enough. Um, so this is what's happening. And, and I only imagine if what, what would have happened to this son if he had not gotten the courage to say, okay, I am going to work my way back. Luckily, he had the courage. Unluckily, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't have the courage because they think they need to work their way back and because we put that on them. And so what happens is that they never do come back. And there's actually a, another group of people that, are, that, that think the same way. Jesus talks about another group of people that, that think this way. Okay, and it's actually found in, uh, in Matthew 27. And you don't have to turn there. I'll just have it up on the... Oh, it's actually Matthew 7, sorry. Matthew 7, 23, starting at verse 21 says, <clears throat> it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So I know this may seem confusing because at first he says, listen, those who do the will of my Father in heaven, those are going to be the people that, that actually make it into heaven, right? But if you go further, he actually says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So here's the issue. These people thought that, okay, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing things. I am, I am working for God. I'm, I'm, I'm prophesying in his name. I'm doing wonders in his name. I'm casting out demons in his name. They're doing, they're doing a ton of great things, right, for him. But yet for some reason, they're still not able to, quote, unquote, enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the reason why is, is, is in verse 23, God says, I never knew you. So listen, it is possible to do work for God and yet not have a real relationship with God. It's possible to do things for him and still not actually have a relationship with him. But I will say this, it's impossible to have a relationship with God and not work for him. It's impossible, okay? And actually, it, 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 because when you, when you know God, you then are, are convicted, right, to, do, to, to, to obey him. And, and it works like this. This is, how, this, is how, this is how I see it working, okay? Um, to know God is to love God, and to love God is to obey God, right? So if I know God, it's impossible for me not to fall in love with God. If I know him, I will see his perfect character, I will see his love, his, his, his justice, his, his mercy, his graciousness, and I will fall in love with him. It's impossible for any person to truly know God and not fall in love with him. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, correct? But here's the thing. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He does not say, keep my commandments in order to love me. So this, is, uh, so, so this brings me to my next point, and that is doing the will of God is simply a symptom of knowing God. It is not a requirement. Doing the will of God is simply a symptom of knowing God. So doing the will of God is not the thing itself. Okay, It's a symptom of the thing, but the thing itself is knowing God. And some of you may know that, um, that my girlfriend is... is she is 
in school to become a nurse, okay? And so I hear a lot of stories from her when, she's, when she goes and, and she works at the hospital for the day. They do, they do clinical. Part of the program is they, they have to go to the hospital and do, and do clinicals where they, they spend the day, you know, helping people and, and, and getting that experience, okay? And getting that, getting that understanding of what it's like to be a nurse. And so she tells me these stories, and, and, and one of the things that, that nurses do is they do what they call a head-to-toe assessment. Okay, if you go to the hospital, they're going to do a head-to-toe assessment to check to see if, if you're healthy or if anything's wrong. And some of these tests, like one of these tests is, is that they will, um, one of these tests is that they'll uh, shine a light in your eyes, right? So they'll shine a light in your eyes, and they'll see if your eyes dilate. If your eyes dilate and they're both equally rounded, that means most likely you don't have any neurological problems, that your brain's working just fine. Okay, if, if, if that's happening, if, if, if your eyes dilate, then that means that you don't most likely have any neurological problems, okay? But the thing is, your eyes dilating and being equally round is simply a symptom of your brain working well. Okay, if I go and I go and I get my, and, I, and they, they do the head-to-toe assessment and they check my eyes, if they're dilating, that just, that simply means that it's a symptom of the fact that my brain is, is working just fine. It's working at normal capacity. There's, there's, there's more, more than likely nothing wrong with it. But the eyes, dilating, the eyes dilating aren't the thing itself. The thing itself is your brain. They're wanting to see what your brain is like. Okay, they're wanting to see if, you're, if your brain is healthy, and that's the way that they're checking. Because the only way they can check that is, is through the symptom. But I do want to continue, I, I want you to, to really know this, is that it's, it's simply a symptom of knowing God. But the thing is, I want to also add this. If you know God, that doesn't mean that automatically you're going to be perfect. I mean, there's no way. Just because you know God doesn't mean that you, you're automatically a perfect human being and you're just going to continue and you're, gonna, and you're, gonna, you're, not, you're never going to do anything wrong. Okay, that's not a, that's not a thing. Actually, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes 7.20, it says, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. There's not a just man on earth who, who does good and does not sin. If I'm a child, right, and my mother can attest to this, I love my mother, right? I do, and I, I really, really do. Uh, sometimes it may not be apparent, but I for sure love my mother, and she knows that, okay? But she knows quite well that that doesn't make me perfect. She knows that I am not going to automatically just do every single thing the right way, and I'm never going to mess up. And she knows that even if I mess up, though, even if I mess up, that doesn't mean that I'm, out of, that I'm kicked out of the family. And much in the same way with God. Yes, we do, if we love him, then we are transformed. And we are, when we start, to, we start to obey him and, and the symptoms come, but that doesn't mean that we're automatically going to be perfect. And just because we're not perfect, if we mess up, God isn't saying, oh, you messed up? Okay, well, let me just erase your name out of the, out of the, out of the book of life. He doesn't flip-flop back and forth and say, oh, you messed up? Okay, well, you're back here. Oh, you finally, like, you, you finally come back and you finally uh, done right and you've, you've paid tithe the, the, the perfect amount. Okay, well, you're back into the, into the book of life. That's not what's happening. All right? And that really needs to be another, another thing that's, that's understood. So, <clears throat> um, the thing, so Matthew 7, 23, and I want to come back to this point, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is the main point. The reason why they're not entering into the kingdom of heaven is because they never knew Jesus. It's about knowing him, knowing him, knowing him. Okay? Um, and also, I want to, 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 to point this out as well. There's, and this is something that I, uh, that, that, okay, let me just, let me just say this. There's a, there's a saying, right? And the saying goes like this. It's, it's, you can't work your way into heaven, but you can work your way out of heaven. Right? Good saying. Sounds great. But as of, I think, maybe just a couple weeks ago when I, was, when I was looking these things up, I will say this. I no longer do believe that. And for this reason. If you can't work your way into heaven and, we're, and, and getting into heaven, if that's your goal, um, shouldn't be, but if that's the goal, and knowing God, simply knowing God is 
is how you get into heaven, is how you have eternal life, right? And the works come as a symptom, then that must mean that it's that if you are out of heaven, quote unquote, then it was never really about the fact that you worked your way out of it. It's about the fact that you didn't know him, and because you didn't know him, then you didn't work for him. Is that, I mean, do, do you guys understand that? Like, is, does that make sense? Because I know it, might, it may be a little confusing. So, yeah, we understand? Okay. Um, so it's, it's impossible to work your way out of heaven because the only way to get yourself out of heaven is if you don't know him in the first place. And then, because the works are a symptom, then those works will follow, which you won't be doing works for him. Okay? But it's all because works are a, simply a system, or a symptom. All right? Um, so, so, as I, so, okay, we, if we go back to the story, Luke 15, if you would jump back with me. Um, Luke 15, and then going again to... <clears throat> Reading in verse 20, starting with verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So the son is over here trying to come back, right? So the son, the son finally comes back and he's like, okay, I'm going to go to my father. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him my plan. I'm going to give him my, my little spiel. So he goes to him. And while he was still a far way off, the father looking for him and, and, and wanting him to come back sees him a far way off. And he, the father runs to him. Now understand, running in this culture was not a thing. If you did it, that was shameful. Because if you were running, that meant that you didn't, have, you didn't really have your life together. I mean, you just, you, it wasn't professional to run. Um, what, it, what, what would happen is that because you know, they had kind of like dresses on back then, everybody, everybody had them, you'd have to pick up your dress and then you'd have to run, okay? Um, and that means you had, you'd have to bear your legs. And to bear your legs is also, is also very shameful. It's just not, you don't do that, okay? And so the, the, the father, in all of his great love and all of his great excitement for seeing his son, he pulls it up and he starts running towards his son. And he is bearing that shame just so that he can come to, just so that he can come to his son. And if, I'm, and if that's not, if that doesn't show God's love, then it's just, I don't know you. I honestly don't know what will. But he has such great love for him, right? And so God's doing everything that he possibly can to keep, to bring the son back. God's doing everything. He's pulling up his, his, his dress. He's running to him, and, he's, and he wants to bring him back. And so the son actually tries to say, Father, listen, I'm going like, to do this. But if you notice, the son never had the time to actually make his spiel. The son never had the time to come and say, let me work my way back. The father automatically ran and fell on his neck, and he said, listen, you're back in my family automatically. You've come back. You've, you've, you've come back to me, and, and, and that's it. Like, that's, that's all. Like, I don't... I just want you here. You've shown that you want to know me. You've shown that you want to come back and get to know me. And that's all, that's all I want. Because in 1 Timothy 2, 4, talking about God, Paul says this, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God's not looking for ways to keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. God is looking for ways to keep you in. And he knows that we're incapable of doing good, right? Right? God knows that we're incapable of doing good. We're just, we're just sheep. The only thing that we really know how to do is to get lost. Okay? And so he's looking for ways to keep us in. So why would God require us to do good in order to get into heaven? That's like, that's like when I was, uh, if, if, I don't know, like let's say I, I had a child and, and he was like two years old, right? And I said, in order to be my child, you have to bench press 200 pounds. It's just impossible. But it's the same thing as if I ask that of a two-year-old child and, I, and God asks us to do something good in order to earn our way back into heaven. We can't do it. Um, so, 
just going on with the, with the story. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with verse 25. Um, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Okay, and, and, and then it says, uh, 28, But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Verse 29, So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. I'm sorry, okay. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has, de who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Here's another point that I want to make. Even though the oldest son was with the father his whole entire life, he also did not know him. He did not know his father. If he knew his father, he would have known how the father would have reacted when the younger son came back. Right? He would have known and he would have, been, and he would have known that his father was, was, was crying and he, and he was sad, waiting for his son to come back, thinking, what, where is my son? What has happened to him? The older brother would have known that if he would have taken time to actually know his father instead of just doing all these things for him. Because he tried to work his way as well. He tried to work his way into, into, a, into I guess, to gain from, from his father, to gain the inheritance, to gain what he wanted. But the older son also did not know his father. Because if he did know his father, he would have as well been happy. I, I really do believe if he knew his father, he would have been happy that his, that his, younger son, young, his youngest brother was coming back as well. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says this, actually. It says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. If we know... Huh. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so if we know our Father in heaven, right, according to this verse, and actually, next slide, according to Ellen White, we would, we would understand, okay, this right here. It says, Christ is our example. By beholding him, we are to be changed into his image from glory to glory, from character to character, if we know God, we are then changed into his image. We are then happy and not upset when the younger son comes back. We are then excited, not upset. We are then happy and we are sharing in the joy when we know God. Because when we know God, we're changed into his glory. But the thing is, the older son did not know his father. Because he didn't realize and understand the way that he would have reacted. Okay, and so, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, is, is this. This is the last point. And this is the verse I want to end on. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This, and only this, is eternal life. That they may know you, God the Father. Everything else will come, but the main thing itself is whether you know God. And so we need to keep the main thing the main thing. We can't, we can't require people in, 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 in saying, okay, well, if you, yeah, you did mess up, you're right. You really, whew, you, you messed up there. And you, you've been gone from the church for a long time. So when you come back, you know, you got to make sure that you, you pay your tithe correctly. You got to make sure that you, that you uh, fellowship in every right way. You need to make sure that you're doing good. You need to make sure that you're doing all these different things. These things are important. I'm not saying they're not. But they are not requirements into eternal life. The only requirement is knowing the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, okay? And so we have to really, really pound that into our, into our thoughts 
that this is the main thing. And, and maybe it may seem like an oversimplification. But the thing is, in my, in my, in my opinion, the gospel is simple. It's that we would know God. And so let's not make it a requirement. You know, if, if, if something's happening, and I know that there, that there are people that are out there that, that think, okay, well, I, you know, if I, if I mess up, then I'm just, I, I'm no longer a child of God. You are free to struggle. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not encouraging it. I'm not encouraging you to, to just go off and do whatever you want and say I'm still a child of God, you know? But I am saying that if you do something like if, if for some reason you get upset at somebody and decide that you, that you don't want to see them for a little while, you know, if you, if you do something, if you, miss, if you miss tithe for a week or two weeks, if you're not able to pay tithe, these are things that aren't going to get you kicked out of heaven. These are things that aren't going to, it, it, it's, it's about whether you know God and the symptoms will come. You're free, you are free to struggle. As I said again, please don't take me wrong. Don't think that I'm encouraging this. But I am saying if this is something that does happen, don't fear for your eternal life. Have security in knowing that God wants to know you. And God wants to love you. And if you've done something, if you have, if there is a reason, if you know somebody who has, who has left the church, who has left a relationship with God, encourage them to just, it, it, don't, don't try to put on so much weight. Don't try to put so much weight on them and say, look, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Like, it's okay. Like, it, maybe you messed up, but you can come back eventually by, by doing this and this and this. Just encourage them. Tell them God wants to know them. God wants them back. God's running after them. And God is, is, is wanting to, to just hold them and hug them and say, listen, I know you want to know me and I want to know you. Let's work on this. Let's, let's just, let's go from here. Let's, let's have a walk. And let's walk forever. Let's walk together forever. Just like Enoch did with, with God in Genesis. He walked with God, right? And so I'm just encouraging you to know God. Know God. The other things will fall in place. But don't stress, okay? Because God just wants to know you. Thank you.